Okay, so why don't we get started with this afternoon's session of the, the boot camp day on uh, electrical systems, power systems. Uh, and the first speaker is Sean Mine from the University of Florida, and we'll hear about the flow of information. Great, great, thank you very much. And thank you all for organi all the organizers and the staff for making this possible. I'm thrilled to be here. It's a fantastic experience. Um, so this is, uh, I'm going to start with a bit of my own background. I think most of you who know me know me from the Big Red Book, uh, this book by Richard Tweedy on uh, Markov chains. Um, and then 15 years ago at the University of Illinois, I met this economist, Inku Cho. That's not a generic picture of an economist. That's uh, Inku Cho at Illinois. Um, and he actually came to me with the question of, can we try to come up with a model to understand the California power crisis? And uh, I knew nothing about economics, a lot about stochastic models. You know, he was the economist who worked in the area. Before. Um, and um, this, you know, you know, internet cafes weren't that busy back then. <laughs> and we got to go to the cafe once a week and try to come up with a model. And eventually it led to this paper um, on dynamics of ancillary service prices in power distribution systems kind of a funky title because really we're talking about transmission. Um, but uh, it took us about six years to get this in a journal because we didn't realize how inflammatory this was. You know? So this was the beginning of an interesting conversation with economists uh, for the last 15 years. Um, the uh, a wonderful experience meeting Tom Sargent at NYU uh, who gave a, a, a very kind of view of my second book on uh, stochastic networks, you know, control of networks. Um, and he, he wrote that my earlier book with Tweedy is the Bible for economists. That's his quote. Uh, I didn't know that, so that's how he felt at the time. I don't know if he feels that way now. Uh, but today, amongst other things, I sort of don't focus so much on economics, but on control and, uh, and distributed control in particular with uh, um, my colleague, uh, um, Kobir Baru at uh, Florida and uh, Anna Bushic, who will be visiting, he'll be arriving here in March, and our students. Um, I also work in stochastic control and Markov processes still, and so stay tuned for Zap Kulini in March. I'll be, uh, I, I, I plan to give a tutorial on stochastic approximation in March. I think that'll be valuable for, for some of you. Okay, to the topic. So I'm going to basically, I'm supposed to talk about the flow of information. Now it'd be really boring to give a list of all the signals in the grid. Um, so I'm gonna talk about what information signals are important and also give you a bit of the dynamics. Um, and I'm going to talk, I decided to devote quite a bit of time to explain how today's grid is a distributed control system. And it's fascinating, there's nothing else like it. There's no massive control system like the power grid. And it's a distributed control architecture and it's the kind of thing that would make a CS person just jump up and down with joy. It's such a cute, you know, very sweet architecture. And it's, oh, I not, uh, all right, <laughs> okay. Uh, so luckily none of that previous uh, discussion was heard by anyone. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so then I get, so a big topic is storage today. California wants to spend billions of dollars on batteries. And I'm going to talk about that as a, as a, as a, as a big supplier of the signals that are required in the future. Okay. So first of all, information signals. So, um, you know, basically we've got on the grid side, 
we have energy measured in megawatt hours and power in megawatts, but you'll always see that messed up. So when people, you read an article about batteries, they'll talk about a battery has 100 megawatts, and you don't know what they're talking about. It's this, uh, so there's a huge, always, always has a mistake there. We, we you know, we've, we've heard a bit about frequency and volts and maybe not VARs and harmonics and all that. Um, there's, right now, you know, the solar is hitting uh, California as wind and causing a lot of variability and, and big peaks, which I'll talk about, and, and ramps in, in power generation. Um, and then, and so that's you know, nature, basically, what it causes. And then there's people. And the huge gap between what people want and what the grid operator wants, it's so huge, it makes things really hard. And so, so you know, so Kamishwar Pula will talk about markets and all that. Please, we need to work with the economists because so far, the money part, power is treated as a commodity like rice, and it's ridiculous you know, for so many reasons. And I'll hint at some of the reasons I think it's ridiculous in this talk, and uh, maybe in questions I can explain more. Okay, so in terms of the, you know, so I'm going to start off with this, the grid operator. So in California, you have California ISO, which is in charge of the markets and most of the um, control of the grid in California, all that orange bit. And they do a lot of other things, too. I won't go through it all. They, they do things I don't understand what, why. They're, they're helping out you, grid, a generation companies, trying to give them advice 10 years in advance. It's not their mandate. They do it, I don't know, just as a public service. Um, there's lots of little you know, independently owned munis uh, uh, balancing regions, like Sacramento, SMUD, has its own tiny little balancing authority. Uh, so they, they're, they're, what I mean by balancing authority is that there's a grid operator that designs PI control loops <laughs> and to control that part of the grid and to balance also the, the mismatch of power flows between one balancing area and another. So they, they're trying to make sure that that uh, is desired, the power flow. Um, and, uh, and up here, I'm going to mention BPA a lot, which is up in the Northwest. They're just a wonderful balancing authority because they share so much data. So we all love BPA for sharing all their data with us. Okay, so, so one thing that you know, we're concerned about is frequency. And this is an old, you know, a favorite example from New York ISO. Um, you know, I don't know, what's, um, is it 2002? I think so, yeah, 15 years ago. Um, so they lost uh, 2,600 <coughs> megawatts of power, you know, so 2 billion, I don't, I mean, it's incredible. <laughs> it's, uh, um, it's uh, 260 million 100 watt light bulbs, I don't know, <laughs> all at once. Um, and it, all of it was because first a circuit breaker, you know, you saw circuit breakers in Stephen Lowe's talk, it, it tripped. And that caused some oscillations and transients, and then caused two massive generators to, to trip. And what happened is this. Look at this horrible event. Stare at it carefully. The frequency went from 60.01 hertz to 59.915 hertz. You know, that kind of tolerance, that, that, that one hertz is enough to completely cause a panic. And you know, this could lead to blackout. So this tolerance is incredible, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but most power engineers don't even know why the frequency has to be that tight. If you ask a power engineer at Illinois, you'll get one answer, at Berkeley, you'll get another answer, it, because there are a lot of reasons, and some of them are not very rational, why we keep the frequency so tight. I'll get back to that. Um, it's incredible how continuous frequency is, or constant it is, in, a, in an interconnected region. So Texas, of course, is, is completely an island. It's, it's, it's got little tie lines, DC tie lines, to control power in and out. But it's an island. It has its own, you know, it's, its own interconnect. There's a, a wall here with a DC tie, ties. And that has to do with the geography, the big mountains. There's issues with conductivity. You know, Stephen Lowe talked about uh, transmission lines. Altitude affects 
physics as well. And so it's, easy, it's cheaper to, just to cut it off and have DC tie lines between the Western interconnect and the rest of the country. And look at the, how tight the frequency is. It's 0 0.01 hertz deviation over this entire region of, of the Midwest and all, or of the, of the West Coast. So it's remarkable how they keep that frequency so tight. And the, even the phase is continuous, but what does that mean? I mean, uh, estimating phase independently of frequency, you, know, you could always say phase is constant. So I mean, it's a little bit of ambiguity there. Now, in other regions of the, of the world, frequency floats more freely. So you don't have that 0 0.01 or 0 0.02 hertz you know, constraint in Europe. It's, it's more like a hertz, I mean 0 0.1 hertz instead of 0 0.02 hertz. And in India, this is before a blackout, but frequency can float like that. It can go from you know, 50, 50.4, whatever, and the world doesn't blow up. You know? And this is, so when I first taught power systems at, El, at Florida, the University of Florida, my first time teaching it, I was trying to get an understanding of why in India can you let it float a half a hertz, in Europe it's 0.1 hertz, and in the United States it's 0 0.02 hertz. And I couldn't get an answer from anyone. And finally, I, I interviewed every power engineer I knew in any, anywhere in the world. And finally, Joe Chow from RPI in New York gave me an answer. And I'll tell you in a second. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you in a second. All right, I, I promise, I promise. If I forget, remind me. Right. Um, so here's a really interesting thing. So New York has been whining about the peak in the afternoon for decades. So, you know, you've got this big peak of power at 2 p.m. and it's a nightmare. And the reason is you don't want to, a generator's want to sell energy, right? And they want to be at their sweet spot. It might be 80% power and they want to deliver it constantly. They don't want to have to withhold 25% just so they can help put in that peak for a couple hours, you know? You know, or you can have a peak or generator sitting around and have it just turn on for a few hours and turn it off. That's real estate and money, and somebody has to be there. There's staff involved. So that little bump is a, has been a nightmare in New York forever, and they've never been able to deal with it. And they've tried prices of devices. They've tried having a, a, you know, higher prices to these Wall Street buildings, and it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, they just don't want to bother with it. You know, they, it's their power is not their biggest concern, power bill. So this thing has been going forever. The Public Service Commissioner, Audrey Zibelman, promised to come in and change everything and, and create a more interactive smart grid, which would <coughs> flatten that out. Ideally, you'd like this to come up, be flat for, you know, 10 hours and come back down. Not too steep because those generators have ramping limits. Um, but you'd like to have that much more flat, and then you wouldn't need as much reserves for generation, and you wouldn't, you know, you'd have much more, much cheaper system. Yeah. At uh, 2 p.m. Um, yeah. Good question. I, somebody, somebody explained that to me once. Yeah. I don't remember. Sorry. I'll, I'll come back to you. Okay. I'll, uh, it'll it'll probably come to me in this talk because somebody told me this once. But everyone, yeah, you have something similar that's in every region of the U.S. where you get, you get a, this sort of camel back. Um, but the fact that it's so much bigger at 2 p.m., I don't remember. Um, but no, by the way, notice this crazy forecast error. So this is the day ahead forecast for power, and that's what they got. This was yesterday. This is typical. There's a you know, gigawatt there, you know, so it's you know, of, a, of a 20 gigawatt load. So they're off by you know, 5%. That's something new. I, I mean, 10 years ago when I was looking at this, I, don't, I didn't see 5% errors. And I guess it's because it's more renewables. They, have, they now have 10% wind and solar, um, as opposed to Florida, which has maybe 0.1% renewables. It's terrible. <laughs> so I love a lot of things about Florida, some things I can't stand. That's one of them. We don't have a renewable portfolio standard. But I, I suspect that part of the reason for this uh, the forecast error is that. The same is true in California. They, the forecast, day ahead forecasts for power aren't as good as they used to be. And you can see that here. So this was yesterday, the day before. Um, you see the, um, the uh, dashed line there was the uh, day ahead forecast for power, you know, quantized, and that was actually realized in green. May I ask, yeah. is this 
net load or actual load? Oh, so, oh, thank you. I forgot to say that. So this is actual load in, in New York State. And thank you. I was going to say it. I, I just forgot to say it. Thank you very much. Please ask questions. So this is a net load. Um, and that's why, yeah, I, I, in fact, I forgot to point out this heading. So there's something that not many of you know, many of you don't know, something called the duck curve in California, which has been predicted for the last uh, you know, seven or eight years. And the idea is that as they bring more and more solar in, solar, of course, is peaking at you know, 1 PM or something, and, uh, and then disappears. And it ramps up in the morning and ramps down in the afternoon. And what this is showing is net load. So this is the load in California minus what they got from renewables. And that's why this comes down way more than it would have 10 or 15 years ago. And that's this, this is the, you know, this, you, maybe you can see a duck there. I don't know. But that's the middle of its back. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask one more question yeah. on New York's ISO? So, yeah. so you said um, the prediction arrow is higher than like 10 uh, years ago. I'm sure. No, that's my. That's, a, that's all I can think of. Yeah. But this one is just load, right? It doesn't uh, yeah. take account of renewables. Yeah. So. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. That is just load. Mistake. No, it's just. I was just. The thing is that the, the, I, this is just coming out of me right now because I just saw this yesterday and was shocked, and I made a mistake. So I, I, I withdraw that. That's not net load. That's load. So it wouldn't be because of that. Why they're getting bigger forecast errors, I don't know. They got a bad statistician. They, they, I don't know. <laughs> but a lot of yeah. this embedded solar generation is not even metered. So it's oh, yeah. behind the meters. So, so yeah. actually no one is able to distinguish yeah. um, you know, metering every solar panel on every roof, adding yeah. it together, and subtracting it from one of these graphs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Maybe that is true. So it is possible that it is actually net, hidden net load. Yeah. Um, yeah, so anyway, so this, this so what, what the, you can, unfortunately you can't see this very well, but that's about five gigawatts. You know, so that's maybe three nuclear reactors. You know, you know, um, you know, you know, you know nobody wants to ramp up three nuclear reactors. <laughs> what are you going to do about this? So this, this ramp up and ramp down, or ramp up here, ramp up there, and ramp down as well, is a huge concern to California ISO. They really don't know what to do about it. Um, and there, there's lots of initiatives to try to deal with it. And I don't think, I don't think they're talking to the engineers enough. I think they're talking to economists and not us. And we need to change that because we need better policy. Because I know we can solve this problem. I mean, there's no question. This is not, this is easier than the problems facing telecommunications in the 90s. It's not, it's something we will solve. It's just the problem is policymakers don't talk to us. It's just, it's frustrating. Yep. Yeah, do you have a question? Or? Oh, no, that's right. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so, I mean, I, and I, I want to try to argue that in this presentation, that we can, the, the challenges aren't as, as scary as they might look. So, so, this is another, again, just to repeat the same statement, there's a fear of this duck curve. Now, this is from 2014. People were predicting the impact of this, of this impact of solar causing problems. They thought it wasn't going to happen until 2020. And then a year later, 2014, they started seeing problems. And you see the prices for power, you know, normally they'll be, in, the, in California, they're like $40, $50 per megawatt hour. Suddenly you're getting spikes to $1,000 a megawatt hour. You know, so it's 20 times what it should be because of the ramp limitation. So imagine this, utilities are saying, give me power. And the generators are saying, we're ramping up as fast as we can. That's when you get a, a Grange multiplier. <laughs> that's when you get prices spiking. And, uh, and, and that's a problem. You know? And do you think those little spikes are going to incentivize the, the creation of more responsive generation? Anybody think that? <laughs> you build one epsilon more responsive generation, that peak will be gone forever. Okay. I guess, okay, so I will editorialize about markets. I mean, markets will not solve that problem unless they're designed very intelligently. Yep. Going back to the geographic situation, yeah. so, so how many degrees of, of longitude do you need to wash that out? And, and what kind of inter... Oh, God. Well, the thing is that this is, from, this, this is from Arizona and Southern California, everything. This is a huge geographic region. Um, and it doesn't wash out much, you know. Um, yeah, it is true that when you look at a single solar farm, the volatility is horrendous. And so geographic diversity is incredibly valuable to get rid of high-frequency disturbances. But the fact that you have a 
a hump for solar power, geographic diversity is going to you know, smooth it out a bit, but not, not much. Okay, so the Pacific Northwest, I mentioned Bonneville Power Authority, BAPA, wonderful source of data, go there and have fun. This is a typical day, maybe a little extreme, where you get the full capacity from the, the wind farms, which is around four gigawatts, um, and the ramped up, you know, imagine going from zero to, you know, almost four gigawatts in a couple of hours. That is a shock to the system. That is just a bomb going off. <laughs> and yet the thing still works. They're lucky because they have lots of hydro, you know, which is fairly controllable. It's got problems. You know, when you try to open up the valves, you get all sorts of turbulence in the, in the dams and stuff. So they're not, there's dynamics that are very exotic. And there's issues right now, like in, not now, in April, the salmon are trying to go upstream. And so you can't dump the water too fast. You've got the salmon dynamics. You've got to take into account as well. <laughs> it's really something. I mean, they really, they get sued every year. But the, the wind farm generation companies, the, the fisheries, the power producers, they're all fighting each other. But that graph, they've been trying to solve this for ages. And, uh, and again, it's something we could help them with a lot. Uh, Germany, we all know about Germany. They were so aggressive after the, uh, the uh, earthquake in Japan, in part, to, to push for uh, you know, more renewable energy. They did it very quickly, and this is amazing. I mean, what, is, what year was this, 2013? And they've got 40 gigawatts of, um, of solar and, and, and wind. So remember, the, the load, the peak load in California is like 30 gigawatts. Germany is big, I know, but still, I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> and so when people whine about how Germany is going crazy and they, you can't manage renewable energy, well, they went kind of too fast. I mean, they, you know, you put in 80 gigawatts of an uncontrollable generation and you didn't have the resources to cushion the blow. Yeah, it's going to take some time to, to get those resources in place. But uh, I think they will and it's going to be, a, they'll be applauded for it in the end. Um, now, markets are fun to look at. I mean, so this is, you, any day you can go to the mid-continent ISO, which is the, so an ISO, they basically, they, they control the auctions in, in, a, in a region. Um, and they also play the role of a balancing authority. So they, they, they also have the control, a control center. Um, and you get these beautiful price differentials in regions. You know, we'll have a negative price here, maybe negative $20, and a positive price here, maybe 10 times the normal price. And obviously there's a transmission line there. Okay. And then it'll change and you'll get all of it. Everywhere it's $1,000 a megawatt hour. And then 50 minutes later, it'll be blue. Okay. And so it's very volatile. And you'll have, sometimes you'll have events like in Texas in 2011, where a couple generators tripped and billions of dollars were sucked out of the economy in a few, few days. You know, now, billions of dollars isn't a lot of money in, when you're talking about power systems, <laughs> but it's still, it's still real money, and, and consumers feel it. I was going to show some pictures, but I don't have time for that. I, I've got, I have a huge collection of crazy price events in, in the U.S. Um, California has negative prices, too. So it was below minus 50 yesterday in California near, near the Tijuana border. Um, it's probably because of solar energy. I mean, there's lots of solar power. The marginal cost of solar is zero, and that's you know in the, in the market. And and then, do you guys do you want me to explain why it can go negative? Does anybody want to add, uh, uh, yes. want me out? So so I I'm a, I'm a big gas turbine generator. I've got a staff sitting there, um, I, you know, I, and you know, maybe it's 400 megawatts, and it's running. And suddenly I'm being told I have to pay 50 cents. I mean 50. I mean what is it? 50 bucks a megawatt hour to supply power, all right? Why would I agree to that? A 400 megawatt generator. Well, what will happen? I turn off, what's gonna to happen to the prices? <laughs> the thing is that, you know, I mean, I, if I, and not only that, I'll have to send my staff home. So what happens is you end up riding it out. You just sit there and you wait, hoping the prices will go back up again. Because you, you, if you shut that down, you're going home for the day. It'll, it'll take you hours to get it back online, and, uh, and it's costly. Like with these really efficient generators, if you turn it off and on too many times, you violate your, your, um, uh, your, uh, 
um, uh, your, um, your contract with General Electric. You know, they, they have, they have strict, strict bounds on how many times you can turn on and turn off your generator per year. <laughs> You'll violate your, yep, yeah, because they, they're very fragile, expensive machines. So you can't just turn the thing off and turn it back on with the really efficient, nice ones. Now, little peaker plants, you can turn them on and off, you know, and you, you're not going to have any problems, but they're very inefficient. They have very poor heat rates, so they take a lot of fuel for the same amount of power. So the most efficient generator is just to write it out. And these poor nuclear plants, you know, uh, you know they, they, they definitely can't shut them down. So they're just sitting there writing it out. Now, the thing is, I don't know why they stay in business, because I checked all week I've been checking California ISO, and near tier one, it seems to almost always be negative in the middle of the day. It's uh, strange. When I'm generating this extra power, I'm paying a negative price to put it where? where it's just, the thing is that I have no other resource. If, if only I had a, a, some place to dump this power. You know, if I was a generator, it would be so cool if I had a battery over there and I could just flip the switch and fill up the battery with, with energy. You know, but I don't have that resource. So all I can do, my only resource to dump my power is the grid itself. And so I'm paying $50 an hour to California ISO for the, to use them as a battery, just to dump my power. It's a lousy battery because I can't get it back. <laughs> you know, I, don't get, I don't get to get the energy back. I'm just dumping it. But the grid has that much buffer capacity. Well, some people are shutting down, you know, and uh, yeah. And the grid does have incredible capacity, buffer capacity in the sense that you saw that two gigawatt drop. The grid didn't just blow up. It was able, things were able to stabilize. But, uh, yeah. Um, I was wondering, the picture you showed about with the price spike. Yeah. 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 I understand that went up, but why did it go down that fast? Oh, it was just a, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, if you look at the, yeah, it's, it's just that, that, let's think about that. It was only during a little peak of the maximum slope that it went up. Um, these, these, these auctions are every five minutes for an hour in the future, and it might just be a, a, a consequence of that. I see. So there's yeah. no smoothing. Or yeah. No. 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 Yeah. yeah so, yeah. so this isn't yeah. real time. This is someone's opinion about what the situation will be an hour from now. Well, there's an auction every five minutes for commitments an hour from now. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's not an actual imbalance in the power system. It's yeah. a difference of opinion. <laughs> in a way. Well, boy, is that an issue too? Yes, that is true. The, yep, absolutely. Well, it's a different. There's, there's all sorts of reserve requirements and so forth, and there's, there's, it's based on a forecast. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and there's a lot of weird things here. Um, yeah. Um, and then Texas is wonderful to look at. So, wait, if you ever go, so those of you who are students of this, if you ever go to the Texas website, you'll you'll look at this. You'll say nothing's happening today. It's all blue, and that's because you have to look at the scale. It goes from nine thousand dollars a megawatt hour. Normally, it's thirty. To down at minus 250. And, um, and why is it $9,000 a megawatt hour? It used to be 3,000. But after the 2011 crisis, they did a study and they decided the price cap was too low and they raised it to $9,000 a megawatt hour. So after the, the generation companies made this windfall profits, record in the US probably, they raise the price caps as the solution. You know? Now, there is a problem to solve. I'm not sure that's the way to solve it. <laughs> now, I'm on the side of the generators, and I'll show you why. So this is called normal gradient. You zoom into high gradient. This is what it looked like yesterday at noon. And the highest, most expensive power in all of Texas was 23, you know, 24 bucks a megawatt hour. That is below cost. That's like negative. And the lowest was minus 23. This, this is not sustainable. Texas will not survive. You know? And it's because you've got all this wind off in, in uh, West Texas and, uh, and uh, Oklahoma. And, and you know, what will happen if all these generators go out of business? It might be great if it's windy and sunny for three months. And then the wind's going to die. <laughs> And you're not going to get these generators back in. We need them. You know, at some point, maybe we won't. But if we keep this up, and it's like this, it's been like this like every day for years, and they're going to start going out of business, and then what, then what do we do? So it's really a, 
It's very, very strange, you know. So this is, this is a dollar symbol in my thing. Uh, I think one of the reasons for that $9,000 number is most, uh, I'm a wind farm developer, so most yeah. people that own, own resources, they average it over the entire year. Yeah. Like you say, they don't usually shut down. Yeah. So the, the goal there, and I don't know if it was a good idea or a bad idea, was to incentivize the pika plants and the other things. Yeah. That's the goal, but the thing is that if we, if we all do an analysis of, of will that really incentivize anything, I think we find out it's impossible. And it doesn't reward the right people. Whoever happened to be lucky enough to be at the right time gets $9,000. And people who previously committed don't get the $9,000. So the people who are good citizens, you know, provided 90% of capacity because they wanted to help the grid, they lose out. And they, they're, they're the valuable citizens who should be rewarded. It's a weird, it, it's strange, right? Anyway, um, then, and, yeah. In North Texas, where it's negative, yeah. is that renewables? Or? Yeah, there's a lot of wind. Well, there's a lot of wind here. And I, I, I'm not sure up here, too. But that, that's, yeah, it goes negative because of renewables. It's and relative. the renewables, can they not shut off? Well, they, they don't want them to. They do, but Texas does. Texas will curtail wind um, if, there's a, if there are issues. A Bonneville Power Authority made some very naive contracts with wind generation. And so they're not allowed to curtail wind. That's still being fought in courts because they, they can't uh, live up to so that. You're saying the wind doesn't pay the negative price. Um, oh, I see. So um, the thing is that wind gets some subsidies, um, no matter what. So even though they're paying the negative price, they're getting they're getting uh, extra money from from subsidies. So yeah, that's another problem. Um, so this is just one example. The prices did go up to four thousand dollars a megawatt hour. So that's a hundred times no, uh, larger than normal. And uh, I mean, it's, there's lots of examples of this. I just wanted to show you. Um, it was just, um, and, it, and it's gone up more than that. I just don't have the data. OK, so why is the balancing authority so picky about frequencies? So I, 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 I alluded to this before. And uh, the, um, this is more really, let's think about the generator's point of view. So this is a, uh, one of the new uh, generators in Florida, and it's a um, oh, it's a typo there, combined cycle. It's a combined cycle gas turbine generator. That's CC, not CT. Um, and these are the most expensive generators in the world and the most efficient. And Florida has all of them. I mean, you know, all the generators are this. So Florida has the cheapest, Texas and Florida have the cheapest power in the US. Florida is a completely vertical, you know, uh, it's a duopoly, basically. It's vertically integrated. And Texas is completely uh, wild, wild, wild west. It's a, you know, it's it's a deregulated system. But these guys are really, really expensive and very, very fragile, and you have to really treat them with care. So the most efficient generators are the most fragile. So, the, so you know, basically, I got CT again. It's funny. See, the, the combined cycle gas turbine generators, they're efficient, expensive, and dainty. So, they trip if the frequency goes out of bounds. And what I was told by my friend in New York is that they're incredibly, they have many, many modes of oscillation. And, and different generators have different modes at which they might oscillate. And, and that oscillation can destroy a billion dollar generator. And so these generators will trip to save themselves. And the balancing authority knows this. And so they're enforcing incredibly strict standards on quality of power just because of a few, you know, of these fussy generators. <laughs> from from the LBNL reports on yeah. frequency, uh, modern the, the resonant modes of generators yeah. are nowhere near yeah. the 60 hertz and the margin that for me. Yeah, nowhere yeah, well, near. but Joe Chow. Or two, her, two hertz away, three hertz. Yeah, away. yeah, but let's have this debate separately because. This is the only rational it's explanation. Yeah. No, but, well, yeah, but Joe Chow says that this is the standard that General Electric imposes. You know? And this, so this is, a power, this is the only power engineer who is able to give me an answer that I can make sense of. Because why do we keep to 0 0.023 hertz? I asked Pete Sauer, Tom, of everyone I know in Bauer. And, and nobody could give me an answer except for you know, <laughs> Joe Chow. Kirby, but that may be the wrong answer. Yeah. But Kirby, uh, you know, from yeah. wherever. He was at Oak Ridge, yeah. Uh, he 
he says, I mean, he has a, a nuanced article on why it historically evolved uh, because of auditing requirements from big generations. Okay. Well, the thing is that the generation companies impose this, I know. It's part of the, uh, the warranties, as I mentioned. I know that's true. Um, but this is a, they do trip if they go out of bounds. And the generation company, the balance authority knows this, and they don't want anybody to trip. And so it may be that we could get away with much sloppier control with different rules and different, In you Europe, know. they use different machines? What's that? In Europe, they use different They machines. don't have, yeah, they don't buy these billion dollar units. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, these, uh, these fancy units are not, as far as I know, not in, not in tra EDF. Traditionally, the, yeah. the, there was the constraint on electric clocks. Oh, yes. That if the, <laughs> I love that. If the power That's a frequency was constraint. off all the clocks. But they would reset it every hour or whatever. They would, they would make sure that every hour you got exactly the right number of, of cycles, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, Joe and then, yeah. Does this, I mean, does this tight control really come at such a huge cost anyway? I well, mean, yeah. It doesn't make much difference to the, the bulk power flows at the <coughs> set point, the overall set points of the generators which determine how much fuel gets yeah. burnt in the system. That's not really a function of it's a, it's frequency. It's a good question. But it is driving a lot of policy, keeping the frequency so tight. Joe, in terms of what does it really cost for good control? Well, we'll come back to that too, actually. Well, we'll a topic for discussion. Huh. And, uh, so, this might be a silly question, but this is a generator, right? So if it generates at a slightly I mean, different frequency than some other generator, then what happens? I mean, they, they, they don't. Create, right? Yeah, they don't. They're, these guys are locked. It's almost like they're physically connected by a bar. You know, they're, they're really locked in, in place. You know, they, they, you know, there's a slight change in, in speeds, but they're... Yeah, you, need, you don't even have sinusoids, so the matter of frequency yeah. doesn't even arise. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, but the generation companies are being tortured, and we really need them. So they're not the enemy. <laughs> they're really not the enemy. I mean, they, well, we're going to talk about Droop in a moment and AGC. I'll, I'll define that in a moment. And they're asked to provide ramping services, not these delicate babies, but other generators. Um, and they're not really, there's no way of compensating for them properly. So it's really an issue right now. And, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on. So what about you guys? So you all consume power. We're consuming power right now, I can see it. And uh, I'm gonna ask you all to take a quality of life test. And this is gonna help to, uh, to feed into some other discussion. So how would you feel if a stranger unplugged your computer or just turned off the lights? So basically, it happened at time t naught, and you were happy. And how, how would you sketch in this plot? <laughs> <laughs> no. And it would depend, of course. But you've got a you've got a deadline for proposal or something like that. And you know you'd look like that, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's of course, all right. So that's a, a rational agent would scream if you pulled the plug in their computer for various reasons. Now, obviously, there are other loads where it might be different. So your refrigerator, your water heater. Your pool pump, if you have a pool pump, so there's a million of them in California, so I bet a few of you have one. Um, and you know it would be different, right? And I, I conjecture it would look just like that. You, know, you pull the plug in my fridge, eh. <laughs> you plug it back in in 10 minutes, okay? <laughs> it's nothing. It doesn't mean anything to you. And the same is true for water heaters and pool pumps. Unplug my pool pump for a week. I don't care. Oh, not a week, two days. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah. Take it out to three days, and then, and then a week, and then two weeks. Yeah. No, the thing is, it's a matter of time scales, which I'll talk about. It's the, yeah, and that's yeah, that's why I put it. So for a pool pump, this would be forty-eight hours. For a fridge, this would be thirty minutes. For a water heater, this would be two hours. So the thing is, these are all flexible loads, but flexible does not mean dispensable. They can, the sh the power can be shifted, okay, and it's because of thermal inertia or the time constants of algae. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so there's a form of storage, you know, I mean, I've got a budget for getting rid of algae, you know, and I can use it now or I can wait a bit and use it later. There's a, that budget is storage, right? <laughs> and, uh, okay, so I want to, you know, basically that's one thing we should be discussing in the next months is how to make use of this mismatch between power and, and what the consumer wants is really valuable, you know, to the fact that they're flexible. Okay, so... Um, Let's go through to a crash course in control. So I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to get into a lot of details, but I'm going to talk about the magic of distributed control today. So first of all, 
flight control. The, the analogy is almost perfect for one airplane. Um, so you've got an airplane, I don't know about, about aerospace engineering, but you've got an airplane and they have ailerons and flaps and elevators, things that move up and down. And, and they're nonlinear devices. But what they've learned is, is that if they put in local feedback loops, so they put in little local feedback loops, completely like, a, you know, basically local measurements of angle and, and, low, and measurements of where you want the angle to be, you can linearize the dynamics. And then it makes, you know, the, the reason for that is it simplifies the control from the, uh, the flight control system. Okay? Because then the linearity assumption is valid because you've linearized uh, to this local control. It simplifies everything Im immensely. Now the same thing happens in the grid. And there are multiple analogies I can make. Um, so here's the grid. Right. So you've got a balancing authority, which is, they're beautiful to see, just millions of dollars in, in displays and computers, and they have old-fashioned telephones. They pick up calls and call generation. Uh, they do. <laughs> and they have a grid, you know, the generators, you know, these big generators, and the generators are analogous to jet engine, it's on an airplane. Um, the ancillary services are what actuates a, a, a command from the balancing authority. Ramp up power, ramp down, ramp up, ramp down. Those are called ancillary services. They're just like the flaps in an airplane. Okay, so just throwing that into your brain. You know, so to, you know, managing the grid is like flying an airplane. And when you th it's really useful because you think about how robust flight control is. We fly through these crazy storms. And you know, how many people died last year in, in the US in, flight, in, in uh, flight crashes. Did you hear that? Yeah, zero. <laughs> I mean, the reliability, considering what a horrible, how much, how much the, the, this magnitude of the disturbances that airplanes face, we should be able to control the grid if we can control an airplane. <laughs> all right. Okay, so uh, don't forget, I expect all of you now control experts, you saw Richard Murray's talk, <laughs> and you know that PI control is like the 95% of what's used. You all know what a body plot is and a step response, right? All right, you all. <laughs> so that, yeah. So this this looks like uh, this. This will look familiar in a moment. That oscillatory behavior is something you see in grids all the time. So don't forget that, and don't forget this: that frequency is constant over a region all the time. I mean, if there's a crazy, you know, if a nuclear bomb lands in Illinois, yeah, it won't be constant. I mean. It's always constant. I mean, it it's, might be off by 0 0.03 hertz from here to here, but that's all. It's amazing. So you, you must feel excited about what I'm going to say. You know, imagine having a global signal you know, for control. It's fantastic. So that's what, that's what makes the grid work. The fact that you have a, a signal that's global and doesn't have to be communicated, which is something that Stephen Lowe is pointing out you can use for other purposes, is incredible for controlling the grid. Right. So don't forget that. So let's do it. Crash course in control. So number one, you've got this, this big block diagram. Don't worry about it. Mainly, don't forget that frequency, system frequency is a global you know, quantity which everybody can measure. And what the generators have is a governor and when they see deviation in frequency, they'll open up the valves more or reduce them more, depending. And it's almost PI control. It's a stabilized integral controller is what it is. Okay. So there's a, a static analysis you'll mainly see in textbooks. But this is like the aileron th trick. This is like a little feedback loop at every generator to make the aggregate behavior nicer. That's what we're saying here. So each one measures frequency and adjusts. So there's a static analysis that says this will help you not deviate too much in frequency, but the dynamics are being shaped as well by doing this. Okay? So the details of the block diagram are important, just as important as you're measuring frequency, adjusting the amount of fuel going into the generator in response. Um, then you've got the balancing authority, which measures what's called tie line errors, the error and what was scheduled and what was actually flowing between balancing authorities and system frequencies, puts it through a PI controller, <laughs> you know, as, as uh, thank you, Richard Murray, uh, and then sends that to every generator. They're all getting the same signal scaled, but 
That's it. And then you got, that's it. You know, you basically, you've got a bunch of errors there, because how many generators were there, uh, Stephen? Thousands. <laughs> and, but, you know, in California it's less, but, you know, there's a lot of generators, and they're all getting, you know, sending their signals into this big grid with transportation, I mean, with transmission and all that, and then the thing goes around. That's it. That's your crash course. <laughs> okay, just the main ideas, okay? So the question you ask is, why this architecture, and how do you model the aggregate input-output system? You know, the AGC is called, it's called, sorry, it's called Automatic Generation Control. But AGC is what comes out of it from the balancing authority. That's the input to all the generators, and the output is frequency. You want to model that input-output system, you know, those are questions, well, I answered them already. You know? I mean, they weren't inspired by flight control, but you are. Um, it's just like an airplane. So all the local control makes the aggregate a really simple, nice system, and it makes this balancing authority's job very, very easy. So if you look at, for example, Texas, and you come up with a reasonable model of ERCOT, the, 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 you know, the region in Texas, it is the most boring boat frequency response you can imagine. The zero is a normalization. It's just a flat gain and then falls off. And you might say it's a fifth order system and then graph it and you say, forget it, it's second order. <laughs> you know? And it's only second order because the phase goes down to minus 180. Yeah. And that's an approximation. We don't really know anything at high frequencies. It's just a joke. But it just becomes a static gain. And so the balance authority's job is quite easy. Now this gain might change depending on load conditions and all that. So there is some adaptation involved. So if you look at the kind of model you get, you can validate it based on an event. So these are simulated events where you, say, lose two gigawatts of load, I mean, of, of, of generation or gain two gigawatts of, 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 um, of load. And what this is is, remember Richard Murray's step response? This is an upside down step response because you lost something. And what happens is in Texas for a reasonable model, you go to the frequency goes down, it comes up, and it goes to a steady state value. That's if the balancing authority isn't saying, hey, step on the gas. Okay. In reality, the balancing authority is saying, hey, they're using PI control, so they're trying to bring the frequency back up. So this actually goes back up like this. These are simulations from WEC from the Western area. Interconnect. Um, so this would be if the balancing authority didn't do anything after a loss of load, a loss of generation. Okay. But in fact, they have PI control, so they measure the error at frequency, and they integrate that error and send a signal. So in error this would come back up and, and, and go for that. So, um, so in terms of control, so those of you who now, all of you experts now in PI control, if you were given this Bode plot, there's a, this means there's a lot of uncertainty at high frequencies. What control architecture would you use to stabilize, control the system? And, and our goal is to make sure to get the frequency back to 60 hertz from the balancing authority. No? What's that? I think I heard it. Fuzzy logic. <laughs> A neural network. Yeah. Try a controller first. <laughs> so basically, you want to crank up the gain at low frequencies. That's PI control. And they don't even need the P. So pure integral control is fine, and that's, uh, that's it. So basically, you just use integral control, just cranks up the gain, and make sure you get a bandwidth around here, not too high. You want to suppress the gain at high frequencies because you have a lot of uncertainty there. So the balance authority's job seems trivial. Yeah, of course it's not. Of course there are issues. I'm just I'm giving you a high level. All right, so this is what it looks like. So again, you know, they, they measure these tie line errors between balancing authorities, and they measure frequency deviation. They put it through a PI controller, and it goes out to all the generators, I mean, different scalings for different generators. Um, and, and this is what it looks like. <coughs> so in PGM, you know, in, in the uh, east, east Coast, what they do is they take it and they break, break it into two parts, which I think was a brilliant move. They have what's called Reg D, the dynamic regulation, which is a higher frequency content, and it's way more constrained in terms of energy. So if you integrate the energy over, I don't remember if it's 10 minutes or an hour, it's zero. And they do that because they send these to batteries 
which have energy constraints. You know, they, they, they can go up and down, but they, they can't produce energy or you know, they have some losses. But, but the batteries have to take care of their own losses. So if they have, if they have losses, they have to buy energy. You know. So reg D is exactly zero mean. Reg A is not so tightly constrained. And they did this for accounting reasons, but it was also turned out to be very valuable for engineering because you could take the blue stuff and send it to the very, very accurate uh, resources like batteries, and the red thing you could send to traditional generators that could ramp up and down. It's a great, great story here. I don't have time, but yeah. Just yeah. to clarify things, when you were earlier talking about auctions, we had this one yeah. hour delay. Yeah. Here we're dealing with it's real time. With real time. No, that was, that was real time. And what is the time scale? For, oh yeah, thank you. This controller thank you. Operates? So basically, this is every four seconds. So they, they send out a signal every four seconds. The bandwidth of the signals is much lower. So you know, it's like if you look at this, that's this is two hours, mm -hmm. and so the frequency content is really more in the minute scale, uh, even though it's every four seconds. And that's just because of control. We we like to sample fast for good good performance. That's, that's that. Now, yes, you had a question. Yeah. Did you ever put a net sum line uh, in the uh, difference between the two? Say it again? Uh, a net sum line in the difference between the two that shows the sum. Oh, I see. No, I, I haven't done that, I don't think. Um, yeah. Can, you, can yeah. you say again what was red A and red A? Okay, so what they did is that it's, it's a long story about mandates to pay for performance. I might as well give the accounting. It's called FERC Order 755. And they were forced to pay for performance, and, and they found it too costly. So they did this a clever accounting trick. And they took a higher frequency part, which is Reg D. Reg D is the faster one, whatever that is, red. That has higher frequency content. And they said, this is what we'll pay performance for, this red part. And it's higher frequency content, and it's also normalized to be zero zero energy over a period of, I don't, I don't remember what, 20 minutes, an hour, something like that. And this is the residual. So the sum of these two was the output of the PI controller. Okay. And so this is basically, Greg D, you can think of it as the, this put through a high pass filter and also normalized to have zero mean. Okay. Now, you go over to, to bal the balancing reserves of um, Bonneville Power Authority, you see something very different. You've got, um, well, first of all, you've got this. This is what's sent to the generators on a windless day. And this is what's sent to the generators in a day with a lot of wind. And it's bigger, but it's not a lot bigger. So you know, it's not a huge difference. With this almost four gigawatts of wind, we see some bigger excursions of the signals sent to the generators. But you know, I mean, it's not catastrophic. Um, what you will notice, though, is this huge low frequency content. So those other things were up, down, up, down every few minutes. This is, you have, basically, if you did a Fourier transform and looked at periods of three hours, you'd see a lot of content. And the reason is, is that this auction doesn't exist. So in, in BPA, they don't have a real-time market, and they, and they treat everything as flaps on the airplane. And they do what Richard Murray does. They have that, that um, he discussed, they have the trajectory planning, they have wind forecast errors, and all of this all this forecast error that's put into this, this is a very complicated signal that's way more than AGC. And I think this is the way to go. If it's a zero energy signal, why pretend it's an energy market? This is what I've been saying for 15 years, and I never got an answer. Why would you look at this and say, we need an energy market to provide this service? I don't understand it. But that's what's done in California and Texas and New York. They take this and they have energy markets every five minutes. So I, I, you know, I'm supposed to just talk about the flow of, you know, flow of information. Well, the dollar signs are included in that. Um, but the, you know, if you're a control person, I don't want an account in the loop. I want to take this and bring over Richard Murray and call Astrum and do this right. I, we, we can, we can, you know, deal with the volatility by good control. We need resources for actuation. The question is how to get them. All right. And the thing is that generators do a lousy job very often because they partly don't have any incentive. So Brendan Kirby was mentioned. There's a wonderful paper uh, that's, I've got a reference for you uh, from Brendan Kirby that shows 
what's requested from the generators and what's delivered. Here's a really good generator. Here's one that's terrible. And you see this incredible phase shift between what was requested and what was delivered. Um, we've done analysis. So six is Brandon Kirby's 2004 paper, I think. We've done analysis on this. And because it's such a simple system, there's no risk to stability, but it's costly. So if everyone's messing up, okay, if everyone are homogeneous, suppose that everybody introduced a phase lag of 20 degrees, no problem at all, nothing. <laughs> but if the problem is if they're all different, some are, have a phase lead of 20, some have a phase lag of 20, they cancel each other out. So you need more overall. You know? And so, the more, so there's a cost to, to the lack of homogeneity, homogeneity of resources. All right. Um, so is their job simple? So the, the thing is, that's just to the last part of the talk. Um, they need ancillary services, that's what these are called, to provide this actuation. So you've got a, something like a flight control system. They, don't have, they can't go and buy ailerons. <laughs> now that's the problem. Um, there are lots of solutions. If we're stuck with generators and we've got gas combustion generators and hydro, they're, they're great in terms of responsiveness. Gas combustion, those are not the combined cycle. Those are pico plants. They're not cheap, you know, and they use gas. And if you've got to ramp them up and down, they're going to use, have, the pollution will be higher. Um, <coughs> there's all sorts of funny things that are, been, are being used and proposed. I love the idea of pulling trains uphill. That's actually being used uh, for storage, longer term storage, uh, and, you know, molten salt, all sorts of things. So I was wondering the yeah. previous slide, like, why does the generator, or what's the incentive to follow the signal? Yeah, well, it's a mandate, yeah. So what happens to the second generator? Yeah, the, the thing is that there was no, it was like, don't ask, don't tell, until recently. Now they're starting to try to push things. But so far, they've only been real penalties against the higher frequent, like the, the battery companies and all that. Uh, I, um, you know, basically, they'll get yelled at if they, if they flip the sign of their Govern in the wrong direction or something, and, and they'll just say we won't do it next time. But, but if they understood the cost, I think there'd be more strict rules in place. Um, yeah. Okay, so yeah. So the thing is that California has mandated billions of dollars on batteries. Utilities have to buy these batteries, and they get to put in their rate base. So they'll end up charging you guys who live here. Um, and you know, I think that it's a discussion we have to have is that is this a good idea? I mean, should we be spending billions of dollars on batteries? Uh, I think it's a mistake. <laughs> I think we could use them, and I think we should do research on battery technology, but I don't think it's ready yet. I think we should wait. Um, so basically, I'm going to talk about virtual energy storage. It's something that a lot of us in the room have worked on. And the fantasy is just to basically take a bunch of loads, send a signal to the loads, and the output power deviation is just what a battery would do. Charge, discharge, charge, discharge. Right. That's, that's the dream. You know, so signals broadcast to every water heater in California, and they all see it, and, and the ensemble goes up and down just like it, it was asked. Okay. And so basically, I've worked on this for ages. I mean, I mean I'm going to give a talk on this on Wednesday. I won't talk about it much here. This is just an advertisement for next Wednesday's lecture, 10 AM. I'm not sure the location. Uh, but basically, putting lots of local intelligence at the load, again, like the ALON example, and in that way try to make the aggregate behavior look really nice and simple. Again, there's a two undergraduates that helped me build a smart little acute fridge there. Okay, so batteries are the preferred solution in the golden state. They're awesome, except a lot of except. They're costly. They waste energy. I think 10% is the best in terms of in one cycle you throw away. 10% of the energy that went through. Um, and there's a lot of real estate required. You, you need a Walmart to you know, have one of these big uh, battery systems, as big as a Walmart. And China now, Google China Chile Lithium. <laughs> You'll get 1,000 hits. They want to own Ch uh, Chile. Uh, Ch uh, lithium has become such a, it's gold now because of the fact that there's this this thought that we're all going to put you know, massive batteries everywhere. And so we're going to need tons of lithium. And guess what? We're going to have to swap it out every three years. You know? Or we'll, well, you know, technology will improve, of course. But with current technology, you'll have to swap it out every three years. 
And also they're very eccentric. So the preferred choice is lithium ion batteries. But if you look at the, the discharge charge profile of a lithium ion battery, <coughs> they can discharge really fast. You know? But then they're very, very slow to charge. So nickel metal hydride batteries can do more of a square wave like this, they're more symmetric. But this, this means you'll need a lot more batteries than you think. You know? Because in order to get the amount of, of um, sucking in power that you want, the rate of sucking in power which you want, which you want, because you know, remember we have ramps up and down, and the batteries are, are to deal with those ramps. So to be able to suck up a lot of power quickly in the morning, you're going to have to get a lot of generators to bring, or batteries to bring that up. Okay, so lithium ion batteries are great, but they have, they're not perfect. And so, yeah, I mean, to get lithium ion batteries to follow rig D, you're going to waste a lot of capacity because of this asymmetry, right? So when, when they're charging, they consume 10 megawatts of power. When they're discharging, they're discharging 10 times that. You see the asymmetry. Well, the signals to be tracked are symmetric. <coughs> Okay, I see some confused faces. That's a maximum rate at which I can suck power in, in, and that's the rate at which I can send it out. Right, that asymmetry is, is an expense. Okay, so demand dispatch is a term that was coined by Google in, a, in just sort of a position paper uh, many years ago. They didn't really have any science behind it, but they just were looking for new language. And the reason is the demand response if you look at, if you Google that, you'll get one definition. It's load shedding uh, in exchange for a payment. That's what you get on the DOE website. And we're talking about something completely different. We're talking about nobody feeling anything, not load shedding. We're just talking about, you know, exploiting the inherent storage that's in this building right now. You know, it's just a huge amount of thermal inertia in this building. So one paper that really, one bit of work that really got people going was Fred Schweppe's, a pat, that came into a patent on refrigerators, water heaters, looking at local frequency and then tripping when the frequency went below a threshold um, and or turning on or off. And this patent didn't go anywhere and you know why, right? I've got a homogeneous collection of a million uh, refrigerators. I told you frequency is constant. <laughs> you know, they're all going to turn off at the same time. You know, it's going to be an explosion. Right? So this, this might not have been the best approach, but it really inspired people. So in particular, Roland Malamé developed ideas for thinking about a large collection of uh, loads and how to model an aggregate of loads. That's the mean field model you hear, you hear a lot about in this area. Um, so that mean field model is just gold. You know, I mean, it's a natural, natural thing to do. but but he came up with the, you know, the first, uh, first papers on this. Um, and then you know, that this issue I mentioned, you know, the problem with Schweppe's patent, you know, obviously I mean, it led to uh, thoughts about use of randomized uh, strategies. And Duncan Calloway here uh, and, and Ian Hiskins, um, Duncan's student, uh, John Matthew is now at uh, Michigan, and a host of other people have developed randomized control laws. For trying to deal with the synchronization issue and, and to do this. And you know, I mean, I, I hate the self advertisement, but my colleague Anna Bushich will be arriving in March. I mean, we've been working on this for the last five years and, and published a dozen papers or so. Um, now, when I first talked about this with people in industry, it was like 2013, and they laughed at me. I, I remember at Distributech, they said, don't ever use that word in public. But now, you know, they're, these guys now have patents on it. They were just saying this because they didn't want me in the room. <laughs> so uh, Schneider and SNC, these big utility companies, they're building randomization into equipment. For example, this is a patent for an HVAC unit. When it sees a voltage deviation, it'll trip. No randomization there. I don't know why. That's a mistake. And then it, they, they generate, when the voltage is, is restored, it generates an exponentially distributed random <coughs> variable and turns on when that clock ends. And so that avoids everybody turning on at once. So, so the fact that these, these patents are out there means we can talk to industry now and they won't laugh us out of the room. Um, now it's been, this, this idea of using, putting consumers in the loop has been around forever and it's been successful. The failures in California with real-time prices to, to 
old ladies in Bakersfield. That was just a bad experiment. In Florida, we've been doing this for 30 years. There's contracts with consumers so that you can shed load from water heaters and pool pumps, et cetera, when, for contingencies. Um, EDF, Electricity de France, they have a lot of nuclear power. What do you do with nuclear power at night? They dump it in the water heaters. <laughs> so they, they have, Parisians have really hot water at night <laughs> because <laughs> these, cause EDF dumps electricity. And I, I found out recently that New Zealand did this before France, that they, they have uh, some tri tricks to dump, dump power and, and contingency reserves. So it's been around a long time. UK has not been as, 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 uh, as creative. Um, and of course, there's all these, these new companies. You know, there's Enernoc and Enopla and, and Ball, I mean, and um, all sorts of things. And that's, you'll see here, I've got big business, and here I put potential, you know, because we don't know yet if these, all, these equi all these businesses will fail or not. Okay, so I'm just gonna close, I'll make this quick. I, I have 20 minutes, but I can see you all getting tired. Um, I'm just gonna go through and talk about a few of the issues, real quick. I think I'm gonna skip over this really quick, because it's pretty obvious what you do with buildings. This is my colleague, Prabir Barua. We did our first experiments in 2011 <coughs> on this building at the University of Florida. It's one of the reasons I ended up at Florida, was because of these of work with Prabir. And just jump ahead, forget it. You know, basically, you can track a reg D signal perfectly by modulating fan speeds up and down. It doesn't affect anybody, nobody feels a thing. If you look at the fans before and after uh, we got involved, they don't look any different. It's just nothing. It's nothing, absolutely nothing. And there's building automation equipment in the, in the building. So you just have to write a few scripts of code. It's nothing, <laughs> you know. And this noise is just measurement noise. We just didn't have the money for good sensors. <laughs> yeah. How do you get the zero line to be in the middle of this graph? I mean, that fan is not actually giving energy back to the grid. Oh, this is, no, this is starting the measurements. We started measurements at zero, and we ended up no, measurements no, at No, no, on the quarter. vertical axis. Oh. oh. I mean, okay. the fan is not like a battery. It can't actually return power to the yes, grid. Yes, it can. It can deviate. It's increasing its speed 10%, decreasing 10%. Batteries but, can't. But the zero line is actually a consumption of yeah. some kilowatts. It doesn't matter though. From what the balancing authority wants, they want deviation. They don't. They don't care at all about the power consumption. They care about deviation. So this this is better than any battery could ever do. The service is, is the service is much better than any battery would provide. Yeah. No, it's it's yeah. It's deviation that we care about. Is the zero a reference, or is it actually zero power? Oh, oh yeah. Um, 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 um. Yeah, zero is a reference. We subtracted off the power consumption at that time. Yeah, zero is a, yeah, zero is a reference. We subtracted off the constant power that it would have been. Yeah. In terms of commodity chart or financial market charting, that's a straight commodity chart. And I just naturally, because of the Elliott Wave principle I've studied for over three decades, I just look at all these charts and do those analysis automatically. But that's okay. a straight commodity chart. Okay, thank you. I'll come back. Okay. Um, yeah, but I, I just want to say that with 100 buildings, you get a megawatt of power up and down capacity for Reg D, and that's with this 10% of the fan. So the University of Florida could basically provide all of the Reg D needs of PJM and without anything, you know. So it's just, it's amazing what you can get for nothing. Um, but I think it's more fun just to briefly talk about water heaters because it's so amazing. How many of you know that that's what your water heater is doing? It's a Wham, 4.5 kilowatts, you know. Zero for four to six hours. Wham, 4.6 kilowatts off, you know. But your temperature is just going up and down. You know, it, it shoots up and it goes down. It shoots up and it goes down. And you're not aware of that either. <laughs> you just, you're not aware that it's actually deviating. But that pulse train of power is what's so valuable that it has nothing to do with your, the thing that you're purchasing or you want is hot water which has almost apparent, no apparent relationship with this pulse train. And that's incredibly valuable for harnessing water heaters for virtual storage. So in terms of capacity, it's again this baseline issue. So basically, if you looked at a bunch of water heaters, 100,000 of them with, with nobody around, they'd be consuming 30 megawatts of power. Um, and the peak is ridiculously high, forget that. Um, and so in terms of the capacity, it's really relative to that baseline. So you could turn them all off 
and that would be the average with 30 megawatts. You could turn them all on if you wanted to suck power out, but you're not going to do that because <laughs> it's, you know, it's too much. You know, it's just, the upper bound is ridiculous. Um, and in terms of energy capacity, there's some really nice work with uh, Kamishwa and colleagues. But think about, here's another way of thinking about it. How would I measure the energy capacity of a bunch of water heaters? Well, think about fully charging this storage. What does that mean? How would, what do I mean by fully charge 100,000 water heaters? Well, it means dumping in energy until they reach their max, the max temperature. So get them all to their highest temperature and then pull the plug. This is just a thought experiment. I'm not going to do this. And pull the plug until the temperature gets down to the lower limit. Okay? Energy is power times time. So at time zero, I had them all at the highest temperature. I pulled the plug. I waited until it got to the lowest temperature. And that time there is how much time I was able to go from the 30 megawatts to zero. You know, and I multiply time times the average power, that's energy. And what's amazing is it agrees almost exactly with the formula for using different methods, so a paper by Kamishwa and all, and, and he helped. So energy is times times power. So the time constants of the, of the unit are going to tell us this. And so in terms of, if I have 120, I'm going to pick 120,000, sorry, residential water heaters. I'm going to work this all out. And what I'm going to find is that with 120,000 residential water heaters, I have a 30 megawatt, 120 watt, megawatt hour battery system. Now, why did I pick those numbers? It's because last spring, a year ago, they installed the largest lithium ion battery in the world in Escondido, Southern California. And how do we compare? <laughs> so, so basically, we picked this number so these, these numbers would match up. So this, this little baby you know, that you can put in your pocket is like 120,000 uh, water heaters. Right. It's cute too, right? You could pick this up, you can put it on your desk, everybody would be so impressed. <laughs> well, not really though, because it's really this huge system, massive thing, and it's got a big HVAC system to keep the thing cool. You know, and it wastes 10% of the energy round trip. That's being generous. I don't know what kind of, they're not telling us what kind of batteries, you know, what efficiency ratings they are. Um, there's cooling required, and they're lithium ion batteries, so they're not 30 megawatts. They might be 30 megawatts one direction and only two megawatts the other direction. So I don't know, they won't tell us. Um, but it turns out it's not true anymore. There's Tesla, Elon Musk created a 120, nine megawatt hour battery in Australia uh, last, um, last December. So by nine megawatt hours, it's bigger in Australia now. But so the thing is that this is, this is awesome because, I mean, do the accounting. There are 40 million people in California. There are good reasons for incentivizing gas water heaters back then. But now it makes a lot more sense to have an electric. And if this this valuable for storage, then why don't we do it? Um, you know, it's, you know it's lots of hot tubs in California, I'm told. And we've done the accounting. I write conjecture, and I'm really sure it's true, that it'd be at least half price to take by 120,000 water heaters from Costco, give them, get somebody to give them to, to houses in, in Escondido, set up the equipment, put in the interface and the communication hardware, and the cost would be half, and you wouldn't have to replace them every three years. I mean, how long did the hot water heater last? <laughs> you know, it's just incredible how cheap it is. Now maybe, you know, storage will get cheaper and then we can do this, but why are we rushing? I don't understand it, so, yeah. All right, so in, in, in terms of capa achieving capacity, real briefly, this is what happens with a particular uh, control strategy where here's no reference signal to 100,000 water heaters. Here's one scale to plus or minus 10 megawatts and here's scale to plus or minus 40 megawatts. And here's one of the loads pick it, taken arbitrarily, what it, what, how it behaves normally with no, no interference, when the ensemble is following a regulation signal, and when it's being abused, because this was not feasible. The signal being minus 40 would be not just turning all, you know, everybody off, but turning everybody off three times. It wasn't feasible. But you don't see any difference between individual behavior at all. It's because you're just shifting things around a little bit. 
to be able to follow the signal. And that's, water heaters are really cool for that reason. Okay, and so anyway, we can do other things too. And with pool pumps, you can do amazing things, contingencies and all this. Uh, but I'm, I'm out of time. And there's a project with Department of Energy to try to uh, estimate the um, capacity in terms of energy and, and, mega, and, and energy and power in various regions of the country. That's ongoing. All right, so just in terms of uh, last words. So that, that's, this is for Wednesday. Um, so th there's a question that's sort of fun is that what else can we do? So there's just some last minute questions and I'll, I'll, I'll finish up. Um, can, can fridges provide droop like generators do? Yeah. Now, the thing is that my very first power energy systems meeting, I heard this wonderful lecture or it's actually a tirade by this old time power engineer saying fridges used to provide droop. Old-fashioned fridges had motors connected directly to the system. If the frequency went down, they slowed down. They were just like generators providing, I mean, inertia and droop. And he, he said it was an incredible resource. <laughs> but if, we could, if they did it through, you know, big iron spinning machines, you could do it with power electronics. So I bet you could do it, you know. Whether it's the best way to do it, I don't know. Um, but this, like I mentioned before, the, the, for voltage <coughs> control, I think loads will be more useful, maybe. We'll see. Um, what, what do we do if we lose omega? This nirvana we all think about of wind and, and, and solar and nothing else, which is maybe conceivable. But we won't, we'll lose our omega. I mean, the reason that omega is constant is these big spinning machines in the inertia. And I don't think power electronics, power electronics engineers love to brag about how they can do anything. I don't think they can make the frequency constant all over the US through power electronics alone. I just, I don't know, it doesn't seem physical to me. But, uh, and, and do we need it? <laughs> I don't know if we need it. You know, if we could provide synthetic inertia to send a control signal, maybe we'll just have to rethink our control architecture. Who knows, this is 50 years out, but it's interesting to think about now. Um, but uh, voltage is not gonna be a replacement except in very small you know, microgrid setting. There's some work by Stephen Lowe and others on other approaches to consensus. Um, there's issues of estimation. This question of baseline is a philosophical question. So what you would have consumed if you hadn't been enrolled in this program is just always going to be open to disputes. Get the consumers out of the loop. You know, Just forget that question. You know, we just want to, we're engineers, we will measure the physical system and see if we get the deviations <coughs> in our measurements that we, we expect from the aggregate, not individuals. There's es issues of estimating state of charge for, for real batteries and virtual batteries. There's nice work, again, at Berkeley on this. And for water heat, it's like the average temperature, but there's an estimation problem. The balance authority would like to estimate that quantity. And uh, it's still, I'd still call it an open question. Um, there's a cost to consumers, which I won't talk about now. Uh, there's a value of tracking. My dream, forget that, my dream is this, is to say tracking doesn't have to be that good anyway. Just send reference signals out to all these, these, these smart appliances and there'll be a, it won't be perfect, but we don't care anyway. <laughs> it doesn't have to be. And uh, um, I, I think we can do that, you know. And, uh, so basically, well, what I've skipped over is just the fact that I think we can get away with, with just purely broadcast, nothing but broadcast from the balancing authority to all the appliances in Southern California, say. I'm really confident that that, that architecture will work. I don't see a problem with that. Um, yeah, and that's what this is saying. So markets, all right, just give me three minutes and, and I will conclude. So. There's this obsession with competitive equilibrium for design and analysis of electricity markets. It was a mistake, it was a mistake, it still is a mistake, and we've got to find a better way. All right, so, and one of the reasons it's a mistake is right here. The commodity of interest to the consumer is hot water. Power is completely invisible to the consumer. It makes no sense to pretend that they care about power. They care about energy over some period. You know? um, and um, 
the thing is that this marginal cost framework has, doesn't provide incentives for investment. But basically, it's, I call it the science of death. You pay everybody just you know, exactly the marginal cost. If, if they have, uh, they're lucky enough to have a convex cost function, they'll make a bit of profit. But they don't make any money for innovation, nothing at all for anything. And there's sunk cost, that billion dollars for that generator is never paid for. EDF recognized it decades ago. If you really read Schweppe's book, he says this too. So people cite Schweppe as pushing for marginal cost, real-time prices. He, he, has, he has text disputing this himself. Um, so the thing is, there's risk all over the place. The, generation, the generation, generator operator wants to know services will be available. They want to know there's 20 megawatts they can, they can shed exactly and no more at this hour. And they want it to be available when, you know, 10 years from now. You know, they don't want people, everyone to suddenly decide to walk away. And they need good quality in terms of tracking. Otherwise, they'll need more of it. Um, in terms of what consumers want, I've already said it. You know, they want to know if their power is available. Is my bill predictable? It's a big thing. You know, I bill. I understand my bill. And with real-time pricing, you never would. And the thing is that any rational agent getting up this morning, at least in my apartment, which is too cold, you want a hot shower, and, and that's it. <coughs> and maybe you know, biology will tell you. Some people in Berkeley they need a nudge. I don't know. Um, but just look at this. I mean, again, I'm just repeating the statement. Look at the difference between what the consumer cares about, that's the temperature, and the power consumption. This is a real water heater, OK? <laughs> this is not some, you know, this is reality. Why on earth would you do that? <laughs> so the way people analyze putting consumers in the loop and putting in markets is they pretend a rational agent is going to maximize the, the integral, the utility of, of power consumption minus the price times the generation. It doesn't make sense. It never did. It never <coughs> made sense. And, and so the people like this because Lagrange multiplies are so sexy. I think that the math is pretty. But it doesn't make sense. So there's an issue of contracts for the industrial consumers, which have long-term incentives and appropriate risk allocation on long time scales. I want these guys around 10 years from now, not just tomorrow. And so there's cost value at calculations for real storage and virtual energy storage. And, uh, and I think that's it. That's me after Irma. <laughs> <laughs> So I understand that you're not you're complaining about the frequency of the market, the fact that it's real time versus um, like, or is it just even the one day look ahead? Well, yes, I think real time markets make no sense because because of the fact that we can look at BPA. There, there's, see, we can see a before and after. BPA doesn't have a real time market. It's a zero energy signal. Calling the energy signal uh, uh, energy uh, market is a lie. It never was energy market. So it's just, I mean, please, I wish that the guys were here. You know, Bornstein and, and Shmuel Oren would be screaming at me right now. But I, I've never gotten a scientific argument to dispute what I just said. And I've had a debate with economists for 15 years. Um, day ahead is getting a bit more sensible. But again, there's an issue of sunk costs. You know, these, these companies have a, a staff. That's a sunk cost. And they spend a billion dollars on that equipment. And none of that is part of marginal cost. You know, so, so the thing is that Hogan, hold on, Hogan would say, yes, it is. It's all wrapped up. That's not true. The theory doesn't support that claim. The theory of marginal cost pricing does not, does not let you pretend that your interest payments, that sunk cost, is marginal cost. So it's claimed that it gets, in the end, built in, but that's not valid. And there are no incentives for building these highly efficient generators. So I think, I think you're next. So then by your argument. Yeah. All these generating companies should be out of business. They will be. They will Texas, be. yeah, Texas will. They aren't yet. Yeah. Okay. Two. Yeah. You know, the, the, the clearing price, yeah. you know, all the sub, uh, you know, all, all the, uh, the, the generators who bid lower than the market clearing price yeah. receive the market price. So they're making good money. But they're getting $23 a megawatt hour in Texas. Yes. It's not enough. It's not, yeah. 
Yeah, it's, it's not. And the thing is, I can give another example. So, so, so in the Midwest, believe, so we have we have. In apocalypse, you think all these generating companies are going to move out of this? No, they'll fix things as it goes along. They'll keep on putting band aids to fix it. So in in the Midwest, back before fracking, we had all coal generation, and the problem was they didn't. The natural gas was expensive, so all the peaker generators were going out of business. But they needed the peaker plants. They needed the peaker plants for ancillary services. They needed it for reserves. And they were scrambling to figure out artificial means to keep these peaker generators in, in business. The issue is that treating just energy as a commodity is a mistake. It's a multi-commodity product. And so, the, so, you know, and so, yeah, and so, and so today, with more and more wind, these generators go out of business and you lose services. Yeah. That's, that's what's going to happen. Absolutely. I mean, I'm sorry, I, I, got, I said too many things there. But we did see it in the Midwest. And the, mir the miracle was that fracking saved the Midwest before all the peakers went out of business. But it was, I can show you articles from back in 2011. So um, what you haven't mentioned at all is capacity markets. I mean, a lot of yeah. countries and a lot of uh, interconnections use uh, auctions to yeah. basically guarantee there will be a certain amount of generation and stuff. So you receive an annual payment just for being yeah. there, waiting yeah. to supply power. Even yeah. if you never do, you still get the money. Right. Um, isn't it an interesting question yeah. more how to design? So that's yeah. just in recognition of the fact these price spikes are not enough uh, yeah. to oh. finance the oh, yeah, generation. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's an interesting pro problem like how to design those capacity markets so that participants in those markets get to you know, get some kind of banked income and then some of this uncertain income. Yeah, I think, I think that sort of architecture might work. You know, something where you make sure that uh, you give some incentive to be around and then you pay for services. And you should pay them for the quality of services. So they should get they should get penalized if they're not tracking the signal they were asked to track, or if they're not available and they said they would be. But that would completely fight. That's not legal today. For, that's, that's discrimination, according to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. You're forced to treat all power that's the same, even if one is way higher quality than the other. You know, it's, really str it's a strange situation today. Can I make a comment on the capacity market? Yeah. So regarding the capacity market, I think in theory it's a good idea, but just tell you something what's in practice. Uh, ERCA, the Texas market, has no capacity market. And they pride themselves not to have one. Yeah. And uh, New England uh, has one, but it's effectively zero price or close to zero price. So I, I don't know what is causing that, but in practice, it seems like what is driving the planning process is not the capacity market. But the thing is that I don't understand why every other industry were willing to have a CEO model. Delta Airlines makes plans for 20 years in the future, and there's a market. They put out bids for, for, for airplanes and, and, gen, and, and jet engines and all that, and there's a CEO and there's engineers who make long-term decisions, and there's a market, and it works really well. And Florida Power and & Light and Duke Energy, they're, they're, they're not perfect, but they do this long-term planning, and they buy the most efficient generators on the planet, and we have very cheap rates because of that. Why is it that every other field you're allowed to have a CEO and not in the power sector? I just, I just don't get it. Um, yeah, Stephen. So it's, it's, I'm wondering, um, most of the energy is actually under bilateral Yes, arenas. that's true, too. Yeah. So, so yeah. that may be relevant that, to that question. Absolutely. But also, my question is, most yeah. of the markets, they don't really consider this, even though this is a big part of the energy. So how do we think about this bilateral agreement, yeah. which itself is a market, yeah. interact with all these yeah. real-time markets, energy markets, capacity markets, and so on, which yeah. in terms of energy, actually a small fraction? No, they, they do. I mean, you have bilateral contracts that are respected. They yeah. might buy financial transmission rights to hedge price risk. You know, it's a pretty organized, you know, uh, yeah, in, you know, uh, 60, 70 percent of Wholesale power transactions are bilateral, you know. And yeah. Some jurisdictions run a day ahead. Some only run a spot market. Yeah. No, but the thing is, that it's just. I can charge my eyes. But it's just. But it's a matter of accounting, Kamish. I'm not. This is not. It sounds like. It sounds evangelical. It's not. If you just look, go to Aircut any day. Where's Aircut? 
Go to Erkut any day. I guess I didn't know this at the beginning. Um, it's a red state. I'm yeah, not planning. Yeah, forget it. <laughs> but go to, go to Erkut any, every, any day, and you'll see this every day. So there's no way that this can continue. Generators are, are losing money every day in, in Texas. And maybe they're hoping for that lottery that there'll be a crisis and they'll get you know, a billion dollars. To be more fair, though, yeah. what you show is just only a snapshot. Oh, no, no, this is, I didn't try, look for this. Oh, no, no. Uh, we'll go to Aircar right now. It's like that every the minute. snapshot of a particular time period in a day. That's noon. Exactly. It's just one period. Always. Minute. Every yeah. minute it's like this. Exactly. No, no, it's always like this. I, mean, I won't go, I won't do it. I, I have 10 students working at Aircar's, so. But it's always like this. Maybe we should look at the balance <coughs> sheets of generating companies in yeah. Texas. Yeah. And, and the other thing I want to do is. I want to look. I want to look at the generation mix in California, or so, which has the, you know these real-time markets, versus Florida, which has a dictatorship, a CEO model, we, and what the efficiency is of generation there in Florida compared to California or so the Midwest. I'll bet it's way more efficient, because who would invest in a billion-dollar generator with all the uncertainty here? Well, we have a dictatorship. <laughs> 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 okay, that's, that's perfect. Yeah. So that made it look so great. We have the lower zone at 3.30. Fantastic.